Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this evening's virtual artist talk. I'm Rebecca Manning, curator of the exhibition Renovatio Artists and Antiquity on view at the Mulvane Art Museum through May 14th, 2021. Featuring a selection of works from the early modern era to the present day, this exhibition considers the various ways artists represented in the Mulvane Art Museum's permanent collection engaged ancient Greek and Roman art and culture. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of the artists represented in the exhibition, Rachel Livedallin. Rachel Livedallin earned her bachelor's in studio art and art history from the University of Virginia. In 2014, Livedallin graduated with an MFA in printmaking from the University of Iowa. She is currently an associate professor of art at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas, and heads the printmaking area. Liv Nolan's creative practice explores contemporary representations of gender through the lens of past histories and mythologies. This evening, Rachel will be discussing her creative practice. After her artist talk, we'll leave time for a Q&A. So please submit any questions you have for Rachel in the chat. All right, thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you to you and the museum for the invitation um, to chat with everyone tonight. And thanks for everyone for uh, spending your Thursday evening with me. So the image on screen is my studio and that's one of my two adorable dogs. The other one just doesn't really pose for pictures quite as well. Uh, let's see, whoops, too far. There we go. So I'm gonna start with this image. Um, this work is from 2014, and it was created right after I moved to Texas after finishing graduate school. There are a number of threads between my current work and the work that I was making while I was in, in the MFA program at Iowa, the largest being an interest in cultural representations of women and femininity at different points throughout history. So I look at how women are represented throughout art history and the ways in which there are larger tropes that form. And those tropes then formulate our definition of femininity, what it is, what it looks like. And typically I analyze these moments in art history in comparison with contemporary representations of femininity. So often creating a sense of juxtaposition between then and now. So comparing then and now, but also um, connecting then and now as well as drawing a juxtaposition between fine art or academic art um, and popular culture. So thinking about art history and representations of women, I started to reflect on what an origin could be, um, an origin for how we view women throughout art history, throughout specifically Western art history. And this brought me to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And let me mention that I am not an expert in Greco-Roman art history, not at all. Um, but rather as an artist, I am interested in what this period can represent. And I've been creating work over the past five years um, that have come to represent or using this work to represent the origins of Western civilization. Uh, which is pretty lofty, but these images tend to stand in for or be emblematic of antiquity and therefore of this larger trajectory of Western culture, as well as the trajectory of patriarchal culture. So when I appropriate an image from Greco-Roman art history, it's from a printed book on that subject. I scan the image at a really high resolution and then I enlarge that image. And when that happens, the dot pattern of the photograph is revealed. So when we look at a photo when it's at a small size, like a little bit like the last image, um, these dots are usually invisible or we don't really notice them. Our eyes are kind of fooled into thinking that it's continuous tone or a photographic image. But up close, we can actually see the dot pattern. We can see how the image is constructed or structured. For me, this creates a removal from the viewer and the original image. So we can zoom in even, even closer. 
And what this also does is call attention to the printedness of the image, the reproduction of the photograph of the sculpture. Um, I'm also interested in how the printedness, this kind of dot pattern can link to the reproducibility of an image. And this fascinates me on many levels. Um, it connects to my larger inquiry of cultural representation, as well as to my interests as a printmaker. So those of you who are familiar with printmaking might recognize these dots as a bitmap pattern or a dot matrix. Printmakers use the same strategy to translate photographic sources into printmaking processes like screen printing. This is also how most images are printed through this kind of dot pattern. So I wanted to show you some early screen prints um, using this strategy. So scanning the photographic source material and here I'm printing the photographs onto archival paper, so inkjet prints, digital prints and then screen printing directly on top of them. And I'm often screen printing um, different quick gestures or marks, um, often in really vibrant color. And I started exploring this really just as like an experiment in the studio. And so those of you listening who are artists, you know exactly what I'm talking about sometimes you just kind of are messing around in the studio, playing, that sense of play is really important. And all of a sudden something happens that completely changes your studio practice. So for me, I was just kind of building up this imagery on these digital prints and all of a sudden a light bulb went off. Um, and I was really drawn to this, this collage-like relationship between the silkscreen layers and the underlying digital image. So this image here is actually the one that's currently in the exhibition. And this is um, a pretty early print for this overall series. This is one of the first prints that kind of set the stage for what I've been doing over the past few years. Um, this particular image is the Canadian Aphrodite. And um, she's, overlaid with many different silkscreen layers. You can see it, they're like really dense on the surface, but still this like aspect of transparency in the inks um, so that you can actually see many of the layers uh, interacting with each other. Again, the layers are like quick doodle like, like marks. Um, some of them are, uh, specific symbols or images like like goofy like hand drawn stars um, there's also some additional silk screened layers of references to that dot pattern that dot matrix that most photographs are made up of uh, so here at the top you can see some dots and here along alongside along the bottom so after this i started working um, with more appropriated images but specifically disembodied heads and you'll notice throughout the work that I'm only using Greco-Roman images of women um, so that I can talk more about representations of femininity, kind of being a little bit more specific to, to what my interests are. And I started finding all of these images of disembodied heads in, in different textbooks. I have, I have Greco-Roman textbooks or, or art history books all over my studio and they're sometimes displayed on stakes like this one, which is a little disturbing. And other times they're kind of sitting on their own. And in fact, I'm gonna put a pin in that and come back to that in a little bit, this idea of disembodied heads. Um, but here the statues are juxtaposed with layers of confetti that are screen, print on, screen printed onto the surface of the inkjet print. Um, to do that, I actually took physical, actual confetti and sprinkled it across the, um, the exposure unit that we have in the print shop uh, in order to make the silk screens that are used to print those layers in, in the variety of colors. So they're, they're playful, right? So there's this, this like strong connection between the original source image and then this sense of, of play uh, on top. And often when I'm thinking about the layers that I'm overlapping on top of the works 
from uh, antiquity, I'm thinking about contemporary aesthetics, specifically um, aesthetics that connect to my adolescence, my relationship to girlhood or to femininity. And my adolescence took place during 1990s girl power. Um, so like thinking about the Spice Girls, for instance, um, and I, I note this because to me, it's this like pivotal moment in cultural history where all of a sudden things that are maybe very kitsch or um, silly, uh, extravagant um, are given a sense of power or a sense of purpose. Uh, I think also about, these are Lisa Frank illustrations. So I had a ton of these stickers, binders, folders, everything. Um, and to me, this is like very emblematic of what I'm referring to as kitsch femininity. So it's, it's way over the top. Uh, it's, it's playful. And I think about this disparity that happens in terms of social value. So, I mean, obviously I think Lisa Frank is very important culturally and has a lot of cultural value. But if we think about like star and heart stickers, something like really silly like that, it, it does not have a lot of social value, especially in comparison with, um, with a fine art object. And I, and I think that that social value is somewhat gendered, right? So there are a lot of images and references and iconography that I'm using in this kind of playful way that are typically marketed as a feminine aesthetic. Uh, and combining that with something that's so revered in academia or in a field such as art history, um, there's this really strong disparity of value. So I want to return to this idea of disembodied heads. Um, I created this series pretty soon after the confetti works. These are also, these are all unique um, screen prints. So they're not additioned screen prints. They're screen printed onto the archival inkjet printing um, as the others were. And when I'm looking for images to work with, I was specifically looking for just heads that have been separated from their bodies. Because if I'm thinking about like, why am I working with Greco-Roman imagery? It's because it, it's held up as, as this really high standard in terms of idealized representation. It's an, it's, it's a time period in art history that keeps kind of coming back and is so influential in other Western art history um, trends. And here we have these statues that are no longer seen in their original form. Um, we're trying to understand a culture or a time period, and we don't even fully have the original picture or the, ori the original statue. There's also an inherent violence uh, to these statues. So, I mean, this is a head on a stake. They're beautiful, they're stunning, they're incredible, but it's a little we weird, right? To We have a head on a stake and, and sometimes there are other parts of the body that have been fractured or deformed. This, this one in particular is missing a nose others are missing certain body parts and facial features too. And that to me is, is really interesting that, that these are the fragments from history that we're putting in textbooks as a way to better understand this moment that has been so influential throughout Western culture and Western history. Now, I'm bringing in many of these silk screen gestures and shapes and forms. And I want to talk a little bit about my strategy there. Um, I tend to view the screen printing process almost like collaging. So uh, you saw in the, the first image, I, I usually keep like 10 or 15 
uh, made screens in my studio at any given time so that I can quickly grab something. I can, I can grab a cloud shape or a squiggle or um, uh, a series of dots and I can quickly press ink through the screen onto the surface that I'm printing on. And this ability to just grab an image and print it feels very much like collaging. I'm able to be spontaneous. I'm able to work a little bit more intuitively than if I uh, if then if I'm designing a print to be additioned that has to go through all of these steps along the way. So a lot of the works have some similar uh, silk screened imagery between them for that reason. Um, you know, I'm, I'm recycling images. Uh, this one, for instance, you know, thinking about cultural forms of representation. I mean, this, so this is a statue of Lucilla, who is a, who is a historic figure. And here she's presented as the goddess Venus. And we are now viewing this image of her um, outside of its original format. This work is called Everything Versus Anything, and I made this alongside of that series of prints, so you can even start to see some similar silk screened layers. Um, these are screen printing onto plexiglass, and the idea behind using plexiglass is it's typically transparent, it's clear. So I can layer images on a single sheet of plexiglass, but then I can also layer that plexiglass together. So it's just layers upon layers upon layers of this, uh, of this imagery. It also allows me to work fairly large. Um, it allows me to think about creating a whole out of many different parts. So again, that even refers back to this idea of collage, right? So taking different elements and combining them together to make one thing uh, that works holistically. Oops. And here is a detail. So not all of the plexi is clear. Some of it is also on colored plexi. Um, I also am using spray paint and uh, acrylic paint pen in this work. I have a few other sculptures I wanna share with you. I um, approach sculpture kind of like assemblage. So taking different components and combining them together. This work is cast wa wax discs um, stacked on top of a cement block with a 3D print on top. The 3D print is of a statue of Marciana and um, someone, I don't know who, but someone uh, 3D scanned this head inside of a museum and uploaded the file online so anyone specific piece. I also 3D printed a smaller version and cast it in wax, um, different colored wax, and these heads form a ring um, that's set atop a sheet of plexi, that's set atop more cement blocks, kind of playing around with, um, with materials and what certain materials represent. So like the really kind of harsh cement blocks combined with the slick uh, plastic surface of the plexi combined with this kind of fleshy wax. I also often work with printed fabric. Printing on fabric, um, I should say I'm not printing this on fabric. I'm designing the fabric and having it professionally uh, fabricated and printed for me. Um, this allows me to move outside of storage or transportation issues when it comes to working large scale. I also enjoy the flexibility of fabric, the way it drapes. Um, we can even draw connections to the draping of the fabric in the piece with the draping of clothing typically found on, on these statues that I'm working with. Um, the fabric also allows me to work with print, uh, sometimes printed photographs or designing 
repeating print patterns. It allows me to work with this idea of print in another context and that context being uh, printed fabric. So something that we're a little bit more familiar with, something that has that brings in different cultural uh, contexts. Um, I can also combine it with other materials here combined with plexi and I have this like a uh, pillar hung in the center that's covered in um, stickers. This is another work on printed fabric. Here, these are individual pieces. They're much smaller than the last one. Um, these use the entire, well, not the entire textbook page, but they include more of the actual page in which these photos are found on. So, in previous works, I would scan in art history textbook pages, but I would crop it down to just the photographic piece and then enlarge that. But I started to become even more interested in the surrounding information on the textbook page. I also enjoy the actual reference to the textbook. So thinking about a textbook as a source of knowledge um, thinking about textbooks as places where we find knowledge, but places that also perpetuate that knowledge over and over and over again. There's interesting connections between pieces across pages, right? So like what piece is displayed next to this statue? What piece is displayed on the opposite page of this statue? There's also the text that accompanies the work. And then um, what I'm really interested in is the figure numbers and the accompanying text, which I'll talk about in a second. So this work, this is a drawing um, graphite on archival inkjet print. So this is another scanned photograph, but instead of screen printing directly on top, I decided to work with graphite to have a more immediate relationship with the mark and with the surface of the print. I decided to cover everything that wasn't this particular statue. And this is the image that I showed early on where you can see the bit mapping. I created additional graphite drawings that used um, Lisa Frank sticker shapes. So these are the positive sticker shapes. I also have others that use the negative of the sticker shapes. And here I can point out, so this is what I mean by the figure number and the accompanying text. So when we see these statues in, in a art textbook, well, really in any textbook, they're given this assigned figure number so that we can easily organize and structure this information. And I started to become really interested in that this kind of accompanying information that is always linked to that image. So the information will give you a name of the piece. It'll give you a relative date of the piece if it's known. It'll give you where the piece is currently existing. And all of that information gets wrapped up into this actual object. So it's again, this kind of printed quality, this printedness of of the actual artwork that stands in for this overarching history of antiquity and its relationship uh, to the rest of, of art history. Now the sticker forms, sometimes they're recognizable, like I, you know, you can kind of tell this is like a dolphin shape and some stars. But what ended up happening when rendering the Lisa Frank stickers is some of these really ridiculous over the top fun little characters become this just like these like blobs on the page. You know, this at the top here, these are the three ballerina buddy, bunnies, but really when they're rendered in this way, they just become this, this large mass of graphite. So here's the, um, the negative, another one done in negative. And the graphite is, is obscuring some of the information. I installed these works in conjunction with wall vinyl, which is a material that I use a lot in my work. It's very versatile. Um, I can be very specific in what I cut with the, with the vinyl and I can apply it directly into, onto gallery walls and therefore move the walls outside of this like neutral 
white cube context. I can change the space. Here I played around with the vinyl um, on the pane of plexiglass of the picture plane, uh, um, the picture frame, excuse me. So here I have vinyl directly on the plexiglass. And then I also have objects within the frame that become almost like a shadow box of, of objects. I have um, a gel pen drawing on inkjet print. I have uh, laser cut screen prints. And then I also have these perler bead rainbows along the top. Perler beads are like this craft supply. They're like plastic beads that you can assemble and then you iron them and they melt together. So I was interested in this kind of like chaos meets structure. So there's a lot of visual information and a lot of visual references, but they're happening everywhere. But they're all very structured here. Like they're arranged tidy in the composition. Um, so this work is titled Activity Set, thinking about how certain objects are packaged or marketed um, or held in this very structured way. I also, at this point, uh, wanted to move beyond screen printing onto paper. I love paper. I love working with paper, but it has its limitations. It has size limitations. Um, I typically only show my works on paper framed so, the, so that they're protected. So I decided to venture into um, onto panel combining screen print with painting. Um, I discovered the airbrush as a way to apply paint. The airbrush allows me to kind of remove my hand from the surface. I can apply paint directly onto the panel surface, but at a distance. I can also create different stenciling techniques for myself with the paint. Um, so it just really opened things up for me. I was able to focus more on the surface, knowing that the surface would no longer be displayed behind glass or plexi. It would be a little bit more object-like. Here's another work. Um, so I was able to experiment with digitally manipulating the photographic images together before actually screen printing onto the panel. So that's how this is done. Um, these dots are then stenciled and airbrushed onto the surface. So this links back to that earlier activity set piece. So I took this idea back up, this idea of the activity set. And I'm thinking about structured color here that you would find in something like this. Um, so these are art kits, art sets that are usually marketed towards uh, amateur artists, like kids, for instance. And I'm really fascinated by how the color is organized within this packaging. I'm interested in the almost commodification of just color itself. To me, I find these, these um, objects to be really attractive and alluring just because of the structure of the color involved. And so I wanted to combine that reference that refers to art making and combine it with something uh, like a Greco-Roman head or statue that's coming from fine art. So we have this kind of like high meets low. And that theme is prevalent throughout all my work, high and low. So fine art and pop culture. Not only was I interested in the organization of color that's found in these color palettes, but I'm also fascinated by the organization of color that happens in these color palettes and cosmetic products. There are a lot of similarities between art kits marketed to art making and, and cosmetic color palettes or kits that are marketed to beauty products or marketed as a way of 
of making yourself more beautiful. And they, there's, there's a lot of similarities there. There's similarities of form, there's similarities of purpose too. But there's a big difference in terms, again, of cultural value. So art making tools versus cosmetic products. Um, here are a few more activity sets. So these two are, are a little bit, they're different works, but they're, they're a little paired together. Cool colors and warm colors. Um, around this time that I made these, I started teaching a 2D design and color theory class, which I'm pretty sure influenced my fascination with all of these like color charts and palettes. I'm still working with um, the female statues, but here they're even more zoomed in. So the dot matrix, you can even see it on screen a little bit, is very visible when you see these in person. This one is set of 36. Um, this, this is the set of 36 that I'm referring to, this palette of 36 colors. These are, these are directly copied um, or, or color matched from a um, watercolor palette that you can buy for $4.99 at Target. And this is painted on top of um, silk screen on panel um, with airbrush. These were shown um, in Dallas. This was from an exhibition in 2018. And um, here I also used vinyl to go along the perimeter of the gallery. So the vinyl spells out UGH, U-G-H, UGH, um, but it's the same letter repeated many, many times. So it's this drawn out UGH. Um, across the whole gallery. The vinyl is, it's cursive letters and they're cut in this kind of star formation. So the lines of the text are all of these little stars and they're done in holographic vinyl. This is a piece that was on the back wall in that exhibition um, featuring Cher, uh, who's another cultural icon that I'm a bit obsessed with and also links to this idea of, of kitsch femininity. Here's another painting. So silk screen on panel with airbrush and uh, paint. The, um, the shapes visible in the airbrush are um, stick on earrings. That's why they're in pairs. Here's another work. Uh, this, this has a lot to do with digital drawing. So a lot of these kind of like quick marks that I'm working with, I'm drawing digitally and then translating into either stencils or translating into screen prints. And the checkerboard pattern here in Photoshop is used to, to designate something that's transparent. And then there's these really quick doodle gestures um, that I created stencils for and, and painted in on this, on this panel. That kind of like quick digital gesture is also visible in the facial features of this work. So the eyes and nose and lips of this piece don't actually match the original um, uh, statue. This work, I, I screen printed this photo image directly onto the panel and introduced water. So silk screen ink is water soluble. So once I introduced water, it started to bleed and blend together. I also took a page of text and created a code that is not really decipherable. No one's gonna be able to know what this reads, but I assigned each letter a colored symbol, and that symbol came from um, stick on earring shapes. So they're like really playful little color shapes. So there's this idea of coding, this idea of knowledge, language associated with these photographs of objects. I did that again here. So I, print, I screen printed text. I used the airbrush to obliterate that text and then gave each of those letters back their assigned color symbol. This piece was made for an exhibition I had last summer and the gallery space was quite small. So I decided to treat it almost like a project show. Um, I created a rule for myself that every piece in the show was going to be a uh, 
referring to this specific textbook page. And this specific textbook page I was drawn to because of the, the heading at the very bottom of the page, the female nude, a new theme in Greek art. And if the image to the left is familiar, it's again the Cadinian Aphrodite that is in the exhibition at the museum. Um, this statue is in many art history books. It's one of those images that just appears over and over and over again. Um, the Canadian Aphrodite is also a really important sculpture. It was, it was the first female nude in Greek art, as you can see by the textbook page. It was made by Praxiteles. And uh, that image right there that you see is not the Canadian Aphrodite. The, the Greek Canadian Aphrodite does not exist anymore. Instead, we have a Roman copy. So we can even see from the accompanying text that this is a Roman copy of the original. So this kind of touched on many things that I was interested in, this little textbook page. Um, it's talking about the start of an art historical trend, the female nude, that transformed the trajectory of Western art. We see the female nude as a theme that comes back again and again and again in art history and has influenced um, contemporary representations of gender. So there's that. And there's also this, this idea of reproduction of imagery, reproduction of um, representations because this is a, a copy. It's a copy of the original that's then reproduced in this print form. So a few of the works from that exhibition here, the text is morphed and stretched across the surface. Here it's obliterated again with airbrush. And then uh, there are these kind of colorful shapes juxtaposed on top. Here the text has this wave filter applied to it. Um, the, this blue mass is that same photograph just with many different um, modifications across the surface. And then the exhibition featured wall vinyl. Again, I love wall vinyl. Um, I was able to cut this wall vinyl um, and tile it all together so it could, it could take over the two main walls of the exhibition space. I included every bit of, of the textbook page, including the page number and the accompanying text that was visible with, with the photograph. And what this allowed me to do, again, was remove this like neutrality of the white cube gallery space and transform the space. So here, this knowledge this text-based knowledge is encasing the artworks within the gallery. And I want to um, wrap up on this newer body of work. These are brand spanking new. These uh, works are going to a show in Austin in just a couple of weeks. These are um, inkjet printed canvas, which is a brand new material I haven't worked with before. So, I was able to still work with photographic imagery, still working with um, Greco-Roman statues of women. And I was able to create physical collages in my studio and then scan them. So the black and white photographic layer that you see at the very, as, as the base layer of this painting, that's all, um, a, a scan of a collage. It's still enlarged. So this piece is um, roughly 38 inches wide, 50 inches tall. You know, in the original, uh, you can see the, the photo of the woman on the left-hand side is, is quite small. So you can still see this like dot pattern of that photographic layer, as well as some of the other collaged forms. Because I'm scanning these collages, I'm able to actually place things on the scanning bed as well. So I'm using stickers, I'm using confetti, all of these kind of pop culture ephemera um, that I've been using in my work for years. So the photographic layer is printed onto canvas and then other layers of paint are applied on top. And 
I always like to say that I paint like a printmaker um, because I'm always painting with stenciling. Um, I mentioned this like removal of the hand with airbrush. So that's happening here. You can see the same organizational forms of color. So here are the color palettes, like in the activity sets. Here, there's not the colors necessarily in that structure, but I'm still using the shape of that. Those are all airbrushed. Um, even when it's actually paint applied to the canvas, it's done in this uh, kind of strict stenciled way. This work, um, I have references to stickers on the work. So the cherries and the flowers are all directly related to, to stickers, but here I'm actually like painting them onto the surface, um, trying to mimic the, the physical quality of a sticker being superimposed onto something else. And the paint has this like glossy finish to it too. So it has, um, it definitely has this like sticker-like visual effect. This work, I kept my structured color palettes, but morphed them, applied different uh, Photoshop filters to them to stretch them, twirl them. Here, they're like uh, in this circular pattern around the perimeter of the piece. That's, that's how this one was done too, also working with those color palettes. This one, I. I was really um, having fun with in terms of collaging. Um, so the, the Greco-Roman head is, is located here and flipping through a fashion magazine, I found this Marnie ad and it had a bust of a woman as well and um, drawing connections, connections there. And this is the last work I'm going to show you all. This piece um, is also brand new. It uses airbrush to build up this kind of haze of these flower clouds that I've used um, before, creating this like density of gray, of, of value across the surface of the piece. And then also using these like little sticker shapes uh, to play with, with the surface. All right. So I think we are going to do questions. Yeah. Do you want an image on screen for questions? Sure. Yeah, actually, if, um, if you want to reference images in the PowerPoint, that might be yeah, sure. as you're answering questions, that might be. Let me screen share again. We can put this one up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, um, I see there are a few questions in the chat. If uh, if people want to enter a few more questions, that'd be swell. I'm going to kick it off with a question of my own. Um, Rachel, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about why it's important that the work is characterized or is defined as print work rather than, say, painting. Yeah, I have a little bit of a struggle calling them paintings all of the time because they use different print methods. I mean, some of them I'm screen printing onto panel. That's a print method. Um, I'm using inkjet printing to print an image onto the surface. And then I'm combining those print layers with painting. I also am a little hesitant to dive into the painting definition because I'm not necessarily like making an image. I'm not necessarily like taking, I'm not taking a blank canvas and creating something out of paint. To me, that print reference is important because I'm, I'm like using source material. I'm like bringing uh, printed, images or that printed quality into the works themselves. So I, I don't I don't call them prints, but I don't necessarily 
enjoy calling them straightforward paintings. I usually just say like works on canvas, works on panel. Um, I, it struck me when you were talking and I, I suppose I hadn't really realized this yet that um, there's this wonderful um, uh, correlation with the fact that you're engaging Greco-Roman sculpture, which for the most part is going to be a Roman copy of a Greek original. And um, like, for example, with the Canadian Aphrodite, uh, I think the one in our print is the Vatican collections. Um, but this idea of multiples uh, is actually at play in the work that you're appropriating. And then of course, printmaking has that concept of multiples. So I think there's a really nice marriage there. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, I do have a few questions. The first is coming from um, Michael Hager. Michael is um, our printmaking professor here at Washburn University. And um, he is asking, are there any contemporary modern or modern artists that uh, influence you? Oh, sure. Um, I'm a big Laura Owens fan, which is maybe visible from the work itself. Um, yeah, she's incredible. And she uses a lot of screen printing in some of her works too, that are directly referring to, um, to, to printed material. So I'm looking at her, I'm look, you know, there's a lot of contemporary artists back to your original question, Rebecca, who are doing screen printed works, but calling them paintings. And I think it does like a slight disservice to the source material um, because it is printed. So artists, artists that I'm thinking of that do that are um, like Lorna Simpson's paintings are, are screen printed first and then painted on top. Um, Ryan McGinnis screen prints on canvas and panel. Um, uh, Micheline Thomas even has some like screen printed images on on Plexi that I've seen recently. So there's a there's a lot of of printmaking happening that's kind of outside of the realm the, that really centralized realm of print. Absolutely. That really nicely segues into another question from Gabby Rollins. Um, Rachel, are you interested in using any other printmaking method, wood, etching, etc., or possibly a photo processing method like cyanotype, etc.? Um, you know, I I do create like a little bit more traditional, straightforward prints. In addition to these works, they normally don't make it into like a succinct PowerPoint like this. Um, I'm a big screen printer, as you can see, but I also, I love etching. I'm teaching etching right now in one of my classes and uh, it's so great. Um, I did a series of etchings a few years ago using uh, the CNC, as a way of, of drawing onto the etching plates. And that was really fun because I do really like these digital marks and being able to combine etching with, with computer-driven drawing was really lovely. Um, yeah, but for the most part, this body of work exists in screen printing. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to kind of combine two questions, one uh, from our director, Connie Gibbonson, and one from Benjamin Wells. Um, Connie is asking if there's a correlation between the airbrush and the graffiti. And then sort of in that vein, um, Ben asks, are you intentionally referencing the painting marks from programs like Microsoft Paint and Claris Works? Yeah. Um, I mean, yes to both not necessarily like a direct relationship, but I think what it is is when I when I make a lot of these marks, I, I just like making really dumb quick marks. And that tends to be, you know, what people usually do with like rudimentary tools, whether they're rudimentary actual drawing tools or rudimentary digital drawing tools. Um, I like the quickness of it. 
you know, printmaking is really slow. And I, I like that combination of a quick gesture that can then go through that slower process of print to its final existence. So like in a piece like this, creating these like quick squiggles and loop de loops and uh and actually like printing them onto the surface so the airbrush certainly also refers to graffiti yes um spray paint yes i also will use the like spray brush tool in photoshop to get a similar mark so like for instance here the gray squiggle has this kind of spray paint effect and that's because it's done with a spray brush tool in photoshop and then bit mapped and then screen printed and that was a lot of print, printy print shop talk there but that that's uh that's that great thanks so much uh we have a few questions about display which i think is great and interesting um I'm scrolling here uh carly nelson was wondering if there's um, any sort of conceptual reasoning for, uh, in some cases, displaying pieces on the ground? Um, yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, it certainly affects the, the reading of the, of the work. Um, sometimes it's also, just a use of, of space. I don't really like pedestals. And I, and maybe it's also because a lot of these original sculptural objects would be displayed on pedestals. And I, and I don't really want to create a, a sculpture that's going to sit on a neutral pedestal. So sometimes I'll create my own types of pedestals like the cinder blocks. Yes, I had a piece, I think what they're referring to is, let me go back. almost there so this this piece is on the ground so i made a very short pedestal and i put vinyl stickers on it these are casts of my hand giving the middle finger with the middle finger broken off of all of them um and i wanted those on the ground because it was this like it was this kind of you know rebel gesture that failed and uh, they're a little bit sadder on the ground. They're not monumental. And the, the piece that I showed first had these, um, these cast vases that were also on the ground. And so it's again, this like um, unmonumental way of displaying an object. Absolutely. Okay, while we have the slide up, uh, can you talk a little bit about the t-shirt in this installation shot and why it's up there and what it's about? <laughs> Oh yeah, so there's so there's two um, they're satin pajama sets, and I wanted to um, I airbrushed on them, and I wanted to make these pajama sets. So this was also this was like a lot of this work happened after the presidential election, and uh, it was you know it was a little bit of a bummer. And I wanted to combine this idea of like the strong white pantsuit with this like sexy satin pajama material. And uh, I wanted to really like op just open up the space. So part of the decision to have this shirt hanging above was really just to open up the physical space of, of the gallery and uh, force people to look up as well as down. Okay, we have a, another great question. Um, <clears throat> speaking of different mediums, such as etching, screen, screen printing, mold making, etc., are there conceptual reasons that you help choose those routes to making imagery, or do you make those decisions intuitively? Um, how does the act of screen printing differ from the act of mold making in your decision making, for example? Um, let me think about that. So, I mean, a lot of those decisions happen partly logistically. 
So I, I make the decision to work with screen printing because I can work with photo-based material and I can work big and I can work faster than I would normally be able to work in terms of etching or, or another print method. So there's logistics there. There's, there is a conceptual thread. Um, screen printing is far more linked to commercial printing. So a lot of the source materials that I'm working with come from like uh, cultural objects or commodity goods. And, and so linking it to a print process like screen printing brings in this kind of commercial aspect as well, uh, this like commodification. That's another reason why I'm using plexiglass too, the plexiglass piece that I showed. I mean, it's, it's plastic uh, and it's colorful, shiny, sexy plastic. So there is that conceptual connection. Mold making refers to multiplicity. Um, so I can, I can, I can make paintings like a printmaker and I can make sculptures like a printmaker too. Uh, so, so that idea of mold making is both logistics and concept. I, well, I want to point out here while this image is on screen, these, these framed pieces are, are etchings. I didn't include individual photos of them. You can see them on my website though, for the person that asked about etchings. Uh very much sort of in vain of, in terms of intentionality um, in what process you're using and why. Uh, another question, you know, for you, what's the difference between directly spray painting the marks um, as opposed to screen printing the marks? So why are you screening these spray paint-like or airbrush-like marks uh, rather than actually just getting out a can of spray paint? Yeah, um, well, uh, I guess making that mark into a screen and actually printing it onto the surface happens at different times. So I'll usually just make a bunch of screens and just have them around. So I don't necessarily have that intention of, mm, I want this specific gesture and I want it here in this color on this piece. Instead, I will just make a number of digital gestures and I'll turn those into silk screens. So then I can just have them on standby. So it feels very collage-y. And so, yes, I could, you know, take what I'm working with and just quickly spray it on there. But there is something I enjoy about, about limiting myself in this way. So I'm limiting myself to what I have access to in my screen library. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just my, my specific process. Okay, uh, we're, we're a few minutes here after seven. So I will just finish with one um, final question from Connie again, our director. Um, <clears throat> she's noticing that your work has maybe become more formal and that the references to uh, antique statuary classical images are perhaps less prominent. Um, is that intentional? And um, where is that kind of taking you? Is that how your work is progressing right now? That is that is definitely how my work is progressing. Um, I still have all of those images surrounding me in the studio and I'm still thinking about them, but I have begun to play around with cultural iconography and symbols and references that sometimes don't reach as far back as antiquity. So the last image I showed is, is very formal. It's just these kind of floral cloud forms with different references to stickers. And I'm finding that I'm able to have a similar conversation about cultural references 
without having to be quite as direct with, with a tie to art history. So I think moving happen is the images from antiquity kind of ebb and flow within the works. Um, I'm not like, I'm not telling myself that each piece needs to contain a reference. Um, even the pieces that now contain references, the reference is much smaller and it's complemented by other things within the work. So I don't wanna say that I'm completely moving away from those from those images, but I'm just kind of exploring other ways to have a similar conversation. Wonderful. Okay, well, I, I just wanna thank everyone again for attending this evening. Um, this was such an incredible talk. Rachel, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Yep. And if anyone wants to see it in person, please stop by the Mulvane Art Museum and check out the exhibition, Renovatio Artists and Antiquity. It's on the main floor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.